Sound and Vision is sponsored by Golden Artist Colors. Manufactured in upstate New York, an employee-owned company, Golden makes the best acrylics, oil paints, and watercolors that you can buy. You can find them in your local art store, or you can find them online at goldenpaints.com. Sound and Vision is supported by the New York Studio School. The school welcomes artists from around the world to join us this summer in New York City or virtually from your studio to learn from dedicated artists and expand as a maker in the legendary marathon program. Rigorous and immersive, marathons unfold over 10 days from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time daily and present an extensive range of art-making strategies, comprehensive critiques, and inspirational discussions. Expansive, first-hand discoveries propel artists to relate to drawing, painting, and sculpture as direct methodologies for understanding one's experience in the world the profound impact of which continues far beyond each marathon's conclusion. Generous partial scholarships are available. Visit nyss.org to apply today. Fulcrum Coffee Roasters are a Seattle-based, full-service, wholesale coffee roaster and retailer with over 25 years of experience defined by a focus on premium roast coffee and local and global community. Check out their coffee at fulcrumcoffee.com. Sound and Vision listeners can get 20% off your order of coffee by using the code Alfred Studio when you make an online order. Shona McAndrew was born in Paris and lives and works in Philadelphia. She holds an MFA in painting from the Rhode Island School of Design and a BA in psychology and painting from Brandeis University. She's had solo exhibitions at the Moore College of Art and Design in Philadelphia, pilot projects in Philadelphia, and extra credit in Providence, Rhode Island. She's also exhibited in group shows at Latchkey Gallery in New York, Abigail Ogilvie in Boston, 621 Gallery in Tallahassee, Every Woman Biennial at La Mama Galleria in New York, Chuck's Projects in Jersey City, New Jersey, Gallery Manique in Brooklyn, the Wasaic Project in Wasaic, New York, Gallery Gomez in LA, the Leroy Neiman Gallery at Columbia University, NSFW Female Gaze at the Museum of Sex in New York, Little Berlin Gallery in Philadelphia, Field Projects in New York, Nancy Margulies Gallery in New York, and the Granoff Center at Brown University. She's also debuting a new sculptural installation at Art Ami in Ghent, New York. I spoke with Shona from her place in Philly. Here's our conversation. She can't not be next to me, so it's just part of our life. Um, yeah, I, anyway, maybe this is stuff we should keep both talking. I'm a talkative person, and so you, if you unleash me, which you now have, I can talk about just about anything for an extended period of time. It's a, hey, it I would makes, say it's a disease. It makes my job easy. I, oh, I'm a, I will. I, I used to be really quiet, but then at some point... <sighs> Me I think too. it was like fatherhood that made me much more gabby, you know? Now I just can talk for or maybe it's getting old. Oh. You know old people can just talk forever? <laughs> yes, you, you clearly met my father. My father, uh, we, like a three, four days ago, called me four times in two hours. Wow. And every time he talks to me, he says things like, during quarantine, there's just not much to update ourselves on. You know, like nothing much <laughs> happens. I'm like, especially when you talk four times in two hours that it's like very hard to like, um, but yeah, he hit, he's 81. So it feels like that's kind of his thing. So he can roll Uh, with the conversation. Oh my God. He's someone, he he like has vivid dreams. So the number of like dead, like my eyes are dead as I listen to him 45 minutes into like a hyper realistic dream as, as I'm smelling the leaf, you're like, Oh goodness. No, 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 no leaf smelling story, please. (laughs) Um, but he's amazing. He has the imagination of like a child. So that's cool. I don't take it for granted. Yeah. I used to have to budget when my, I would talk to my dad on the phone. I'd have to budget hours, you know, like oh, at, yeah, least, yeah. at least two. And I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. I'm oh, like, certainly. This call is going to be a while. So you just oh, yeah. buckle up for the ride and get ready. But I think it's, you're paying it forward because one day I'm going to want to talk to my child. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> for definitely. hours. I'm going to, and I'm going to, 
I oh he that child owes it because <laughs> right. of the hours I put it with my parent. It's how it works. Exactly. Um, and the apple I'm, doesn't fall from the tree, you know. It's exactly. going to happen. So. Oh. And you say you were quiet. I was a, I was so quiet. My parents got my IQ tested because I was so silent. Um, and so I literally couldn't make eye contact and I hummed if people talked to me. And so my joke is that I was like silent till I was like 13 or 14. So I'm still fulfilling the quota of words I was supposed to reach at this point that I didn't <laughs> at all. So that's like, it's a bit old because at this point I talk so much that I've sur- if there is a quota, I've like reached it. But you made up for still- for lost. Oh time. my, Whew, yes, but you know it's still the it's still the joke I make. It makes me giggle. <laughs> Wouldn't it be interesting to have like a word count to where it's just floating <laughs> so, next to you? It's like that's oh your God, word yeah. count for the people yes. who are too way too. You know the people who love to hear themselves talk in public and they're just yes. going and going and you see that it thing, would just be like a incredible. huge word count. You could be like, okay, you got to oh. turn that down a little bit. I know. I hate to bring him up because he's like the worst person to bring up, but Trump, do you imagine? That man Uh, is obsessed with talking. And I feel like he talks himself when no one's there because he's just so used to announcing ideas. So that man's number. Well, he tweets, though. It's probably like mitigated by tweets. Damn, you're right. That's going to fuck with the the data. Oh, I, kind I don't of know about him. You brought him up again. Damn it. I know. I'm so sorry. That, and I, then I, as soon as you said that, I pictured him on the toilet tweeting from the toilet, which we <laughs> all can picture we all know. what's happening. He's done. Oh, it's brutal yeah. image. <laughs> oh, he's horrible. I mean, I know you know Danny Farrell and you're, you, I know everything. He's my bestie. So I'm on the end of what's happening in this life. But Danny is like one of the worst people in my life. I mean, he's my best friend. But because right. he does this one thing where he loves to do, would you rather... And he oh, just no. won't let me, and he won't let me drop it until I answer it. And it's, it's like, <laughs> would you rather, it was just an actual one, like, lick Trump's butthole after he goes for a jog, or Mitch McConnell, and then he said, it's like something oh, very repulsive like that, which I just refuse to imagine, because I don't even want to find out what my brain does, and the man won't drop it. He is, yeah. he harasses me with would you rathers. It's, um, it's our love language, but it's like something that scares me. I think I i'm like ptsd with um <laughs> let me truly like he pushes he knows that it bothers me i am a visual person so if someone asks me a question i picture it in my head of course so the moment he says it i'm in both situations it's too late i've committed both crimes I'm, you gotta return the favor somehow you gotta yeah. really find his button i know i try but he's really hard to bother i, I mean know. he's, he's very, very gregarious <laughs> He is, and I do well. Don't you worry. Uh, he likes to ignore my calls, so then I like to call him like three, four, five times. Because even if, if he's ignoring my call, I just want it to ring and annoy him. And if it doesn't, a lot of missed calls is great. I'm good at texting. I, I find ways. I'm an annoying person. I was born with this trait. <laughs> I didn't even have to work on it. So um, <laughs> Annoying, persistent, you know. Oh, the same thing. Same thing, right? <laughs> but you, you guys met at RISD, right? Or did you know him from before then? I know we met the first day of RISD. We have the same birthday, not that it's a big deal, but it does feel like we're meant to be. Yeah. And he was always instantly my best friend. I feel like we, it's one of those where you realize, one of those moments when you realize different people feel similar things for because of what we've experienced. And he is a gay man who was brought up in Pittsburgh, and I am a fat woman who was born and raised in Paris, France. And those situations don't feel that similar, though, of course, it is, you know, there's much more different, obviously. But how we feel about people around us is always very, I don't know, exactly the same, if anything. That's um, the Venn diagram between Paris and Pittsburgh. And, and Pittsburgh, it's just okay. <laughs> Danny and Shona. You wouldn't have seen it, and there it was. You'll just see it coming. <laughs> but yeah. But wait, um, so, you, so you were born in Paris? So you're French citizen. I'm, How did French, that happen? No, no French blood, but my mom is Scottish, when born and raised. And when she was 24, she went to Paris to pursue art. She loves art an enormous amount. And she, uh, she got a degree in Paris. And my father is Russian-American, but born and raised in America. And he moved to France in the school as a lawyer and... They met there in the 70s. And then I say the Frenchest thing about me is their love affair. Cause they were, they were, what's a polite way of saying it? They were lovers <laughs> okay. for decades before I came around. And uh, I feel like a lot of people that's unconventional. I think most people have married parents. That's like a Frenchest thing about me. And then I was born in 1990 as this little mixed American Scottish French baby. 
So wait, but isn't, um, did you take your mother's name? Because that seems to be the Scottish name there. I did. Yeah. Well, my, I have my mother's name. My brother was born right after me has my, my brother's, my father's name. It, every, my family really wanted to play it deeply unconventional. <laughs> Um, there's no real rules, but that's the thing. That's, uh, that's why art became so important because perhaps the only thing that was consistent was art going yeah. to see art and having art in the house and art books. I mean, my mother was not a very rich, rich woman, but any money she had would go into art books when she was a young woman. So we just had walls of it, but in the religion, we had no common ground religion, no, nothing else. It was just art. What was her medium of choice? She, she was an arty, artist in the 70s, so she did a lot of, like, uh, like pulling apart the thread by thread of canvas, so you understand, like, versus right, I'm, like, right. painting bit for big fat ladies and pink backgrounds. For some time, she liked the joke that if there's ever been a time where she wasn't sure if I was her child, it's uh, when I was painting pink portraits of fat ladies. <laughs> and she, like, like, her thesis was, like, covering her. She has, as fat as I am as a woman, she was petite and model-esque. So she has always been a very beautiful woman. So her, her thesis, and always felt very similar about herself as I have, the fact that I'm fat and she was thin, we both have felt very bad about ourselves. But her pro- her thesis project was also about herself. She like covered herself in black paint and rolled around naked on a sheet of paper, and that was her thesis. Well, that is um, 70s, isn't it? That is very Conceptual 70s. performance with oh, process goodness, thrown yeah. in. That's like it's a everything. 70s cut. That's like bell bottoms and <laughs> <laughs> disco dancing. I know. It's like so wild. I mean, it's as much as you know when we'll look back, I know my art is very 2020. You know, we we, we do reflect what we're going, what's going on around us, don't we? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, didn't Baudelaire mom, say an artist has to be of one's time? And like kind of certainly. unconsciously. So it's not like, I'm doing this, be-, you know, it's just you kind of take on definitely. what's going on out there, you know, ideally. Yeah. I mean, right now I feel like uh, it's hard not to care about identity and who you are and how does that matter and fit into things. So, you know, it makes sense that everyone is very focused on that. Definitely. And, uh, as I've been told one too many times by people, it's like, you know, identity and work won't always be the most, you know, sought after. So right. um, it's just a time right now, which is, you know, wonderful and exciting to see what, you know, the art world wants next. Though I'm enjoying it right now. Yeah. Well, listen. In five years, we might be dipping ourselves in paint and rolling around. No, who knows? Tarp. I mean, <laughs> seeing how fashion has been like so odd and like coming around, I feel like yes, my mom's thesis will be very popular within a couple of years. Listen, like whenever I teach a, a seminar class and like Janine Antoni comes up, like some sort of performance like that, or Chris Bird, and or you know that work still kicks ass. You know, it's powerful mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. So you know that'll come around eventually. Oh, certainly. My mom Some, is a very fashionable lady, so I feel like if she's doing it, we're we're good. We're good. Yeah, for yeah. <laughs> so how long were you, I mean, were you moving around a lot? No, just left when I was right before I was 18 for college and then came to France. My father went to Brown University, so he always thought I would be going to Brown, but I went to Brandeis in Boston mm-hmm. and... I was studying psychology, but was lucky enough to have an incredible art department. And all it took was one day a professor said, Did you, have you ever considered going to grad school? And I was like, no, but now that you said it, and then two years later, I was at RISD. So it was, uh, I didn't see it coming, but it, yeah, I think I guess the, were. The, the path was kind of laid out in a way that, in, in the sense that it was something that you could foresee doing because it was so ingrained in your childhood, right? Definitely, but and but not almost no. I had no idea. I had no idea what it meant to be an artist. I didn't. I didn't know very much about contemporary art. I mean, I grew up going to the Musée d'Orsay and the Louvre. Every Wednesday, I took classes in the Louvre, which is sounds fancy, but in France, it's very easy to get into. You just have to be the first one to call. My mom was like up at one a.m., ready to be the first one to call. Um, I just grew up around, yeah, I didn't even know very much about contemporary art, so I didn't understand what making art now was. So I just was set to be a psychologist. I cared deeply for people. I, if I, I think I could have been a great one. Yeah. No, I think I could have, it could have been a very exciting path for me to go. Who knows if I would have been a good psychologist, but I think I would have enjoyed it immensely. Um, but, you know. Well, I suppose you're mining that to an extent in your own work though, right? Sir, I do think that there's an overlap. It sneaks in. I don't even think it sneaks in. It's just right there. So 
But I'd take over the... Well, two things. One is, does anyone really have any contemporary art knowledge at all until, like, way down the line? And I'll take the Musée d'Orsay over any, <laughs> oh, anything. No, it's got my I, second favorite painting in the world in it. Oh, which one is it? What is Dejeuner it? Déjeuner célèbre. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. Immediate so smile pops on my face when you think about <laughs> looking at it. Yeah, of course. I mean, Isn't you it say epic, that, that painting? Oh, it's unbelievable. Not to brag, but for my father is a tax lawyer, and for like a year or two, he was not on the board of the Musée d'Orsay, but he like knew someone who was or something. So I got a ticket to go on Monday when it was closed, and so nice. I got to stand in front of it by myself. That's pretty great. Um, and I, it's one of, you know, few moments stand up. I feel like my life is just a blur of laughter and fun moments. But some moments stand out and standing in front of that and Olympio. So, um, yeah, both of them. It's just like moments that I can like almost relive. They're so vivid. Yeah, yeah. man. I, you know, I took a class on that painting in undergrad. It was only on that, That's that insane. specific painting and all the references and all that and you know, before that class, you you could never have told me that Manet was kind of punk, you oh, know. But then course. when you realize what he was doing oh. when he was doing it, it was just like it's incredible, blowing it up like the barmaid being sideways in that <laughs> painting. It was just <laughs> cubism, basically. Yeah. You know, before anyone was <laughs> yeah. doing it, it was it was pretty amazing. Yeah. But yeah, that museum is so beautiful, and there's so much amazing Everything work in it. it. The museum yeah. itself is so beautiful. So like being inside of it was it a train station once? I mean, it's. I think yeah. it would have, it's just like insane. Yeah. I mean, I am very lucky. I didn't know I was lucky until I left France and moved to like out, outskirts of Boston, which I loved. But, it, yeah. you know, I just didn't know. Life was Paris to me. I thought everyone had, I thought most cities were Paris like, which is crazy because I traveled a lot, but shows how much, you know, you can um, not open your mind to other people's stories. So then moving right. to Boston, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So Paris is like its own thing. And now I haven't been back yeah. in years. I mean, I go back every couple of years at the most. I miss it immensely. My family's still there, so I just don't get to see them very often. Yeah, mm. it's funny. I didn't realize how unlucky I was. Until I <laughs> 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 left Pittsburgh. I'm kidding. I love Pittsburgh. Hey, I, I like to, we've all had like weird things happen to us, good or bad. And I mean, we're all here because of them. So you have course, to, you yeah. know. I've had some weird... Paris was not always great. I was a chubby girl in Paris. <laughs> Do you know how few chubby girls are in Paris? Do you know how much I stood out um, from good to... From, like, men saying weird things to me in the street to me being the chubbiest girl in every room I ever was in from the moment I was born? My father's favorite story is still, I knew you were my baby because you were twice as fat as all the other infants. I was like, oh, oh boy. second one. I mean, I was. There was no offense to it. I was a plump delicious little baby and uh i could i mean i was perfectly plump but the french are you know shrimpy yeah at best you know at fattest they're shrimps um so I'm, i was joking i'm joking I, that does not make paris There's, any lesser but you know i felt sad for myself even though i shouldn't have i did um, right yeah so well how did you i mean i guess it's a big jump time wise but i mean now you're in philly mm-hmm. it's a pretty big difference from Paris so, <laughs> Very I mean, big. yeah but are you I mean Philly's great for Philly for what Philly is you I know it brings Philly. this complete different energy and I mean there's a lot of Pennsylvania in the room right now so <laughs> I know that is <laughs> even weird. tangentially we represent um, yeah. but you know Philly I didn't start going to until I was in college and we would go see music shows there and for me like the music of the city was such a big thing and you know south street was south street mm-hmm. but it was like the coffee shops with like live jazz to going out to the you know the what is it the the true not the true but the trucadero was that it it's like a famous music <laughs> venue you know well, it's like an indie oh, yes. music venue i, well, I was gonna say the trucadero. i uh, i know philly as much as i know like the four walls of my studio i have mm-hmm. to say since i've moved to philly is it almost overlaps with when i became a professional artist and I would say I've not like really taken a room since like 2018. So sometimes people tell me like, what, what do you think? What do you love about Philly? I'm like, ah, oh, I love the walk to my studio. I love walking my dog <laughs> around my block 400 times a day. I love, right. <laughs> um, I still feel like I have a lot to learn about Philadelphia. I got to work on set in South Philly for a week, for a month. I mean, not a month, for a year. When I first moved to Philly, I was a manager at the Magic Gardens, at Philadelphia's Magic Gardens, which is an incredible little museum 
So I feel like I did get to experience quite a lively part of Philly. So I feel like I know my studio and South Street. Anything else is kind of a, a blurry unknown. You know, I have to say, I was very, I had a very similar experience when I first moved to New York City in the late 90s. You know, I found my apartment with friend, like I found some friends and went in on a loft and the studio was in the loft. And then I worked in Midtown. So it was basically, that was all I yeah. knew. I wasn't like going to the Statue of Liberty or going uptown. You know, I would go to like, you know, some galleries in Chelsea or a few spots, but I didn't know the city. It took yeah. like, you know, decades to really like get to know it. I think for me, it takes people visiting that I'm like, oh my God, Philly has like a lot of things to do. Um, yeah. Alone. And same Tour with guiding. Paris. I think I touched the Apple Tower for the first time when I was 14. I mean, I'd lived in Paris my whole life. I mean, like in Paris, Paris, not like I could have. But why go? You know, I mean, I've I walked by it. I I guess I drove by it certainly. But why? Why? Um, yeah, it's just part of a tourism in a way. I also thought that was interesting. I I, I remember touching the Eiffel Tower for the first time. It was very thrilling. I, <laughs> It's pretty epic when you're under it. You it's know? pretty epic, like the, yeah. The scale of it. I think mm-hmm. the scale of like landmarks like that, you see them and they become iconic from a distance, but then yeah, when you sure. see them up close. I've never been to the Statue of Liberty, yeah, like of to not. Ellis <gasps> Island. I mean, I've only been, Me neither. you know, close, like, you know, South Manhattan or whatever. I've never gone super close to it, but I had a similar experience the first time I saw Mount Fuji, where it was just when I was really close to it. And it's alien big. Like, yeah. it's just I so huge imagine. you can't you can't calibrate your mm-hmm. scale to it you know and the Eiffel Tower when I was there it was kind of had that feeling oh for sure especially when you see it from far for so long I could kind of see it from my living room but it would be the size of like a like you'd have to like focus and be like maybe that's what that is so right. for years that's what the Eiffel Tower was to me I was like it's that thing over there and then you know one day you come close you're like oh my goodness yeah, yeah. That's why everyone knows. <laughs> That's it. why, because it wasn't very impressive when it was the size of a tooth. But yeah, it is pretty cool when it's huge. Um, but yeah, Eiffel Tower. Well, so you split. So you went to Boston. You experienced all that Boston is. Yes, Boston is a thing. It is a and thing. And then you went to Providence. And then I got my RISD. I did two years of post back also at Brandeis, which was a good um, time to figure out. I, I feel like I even arrived at BRISD not really knowing why I wanted to make art. I knew I enjoyed it. And I think a little bit of me want, asking that question started in the post back. I really needed it. I think you probably, one probably needs more than a couple of years between undergrad and grad school. I think I probably went in even earlier than I needed to or should have perhaps, but no regrets. I mean, I, I got everything I could have out of it. But yeah, so then RISD and Providence and then from Providence to here. Well, how was how was the RISD experience? Did you have certain? And were you from between undergrad and grad? Were you just always painting representational in that oh, yeah. time? Yeah, yeah, always. I feel like I lack. <laughs> I'm. I wouldn't. I don't even know if I'm interested to see what I could do if I don't paint figurative or representational at this time. I think I will get there one day. But right now, even as a kid, I would be like six or seven. I was a very socially awkward child. I spent a lot of time alone, and I would just draw people. I feel like it's just been what I've done now. I'm, I'm 30, so, what, it's been 25 years I've been doing it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. You, you lack the Krasner gene. A little bit. <laughs> I really do, and, and, and I, I want to. I want to be... I want to free myself a little bit. It's something I... We were talking earlier about someone like Devin Shimoyama, who I, I care for deeply as a person, I envy his work even. He, he, I feel like he has such freedom to go in, in so many directions that I, I feel like I'm still learning to even understand how to, I, I don't know, how to introduce into my work. It's not even begun an introduction, but I look up to Devin Shimoyama a lot in terms of, yeah, sorry. This is probably a later no, conversation, no, I, but I think about no, his definitely. work a lot. Right, yeah. And, you know, when I was in undergrad, I was doing abstract work and I feel, I love it. And I feel, I'm often feeling like, oh, it'd be so nice to just make some abstract work. Mm-hmm. But um, I try to, I don't know if you have ever done this, but I, sometimes I try to sneak it into a representational painting to where there's a, like an image of abstraction or something like that to where you can, I try. You can kind of scratch the itch without it becoming like a total Absolutely. U-turn. <laughs> I think with my patterns, I get that sometimes. Then, then 
it, my experience of painting them, perhaps not so much the experience of looking at them, but at a certain point, it's just a bunch of marks that I'm doing, especially when it's very tedious pattern painting. I like lose focus or understanding of what I'm doing, and it's almost like a choreography of my hand. And there's like, you know, that's so different than painting a figure or, or, or like thinking about shadow and how it hits a chair. Like there's something so different when I'm just like the same exact hand motion like 4,000 times in a row over three days. Um, right. Yeah. So that's do like you, maybe... Um, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, do you work from photography, from life or a combination or invention? Like how does it... I have so many venues. Um all, when I paint my models, they take pictures of themselves. I have like a, a fancy little PDF I've made, and I adjust for each person. I include a painting that we're referencing, an art historical one, like a pose. Then I enact it, and I make it into digital collage, so I also add my own, um, my own like version of the pose. And then I explain to them what I want from the picture, and they send me back six or seven pictures they have taken of themselves, which I really like. I really like seeing how people... I, I jokingly say it's like a art historical game of telephone because every pose right. is just a little bit different and everyone adjusts it for their own body or how they want to be looked at or... I don't know, it opens up a lot of doors. I It took me some time to figure this out, which seems silly because it's not that complex, but it, it did take me some time to figure out how to phrase it to get the right kind of pictures. Uh, right. And then, so yeah, and then I, so I use photography, but I also use my digital collages, which are quite wonky. I use a, a very, like, it's like Photoshop for Dummies app. It's very simple, but it can f- make very colorful images. And then I, um, so it's a mixture of everything. But I am looking at pictures. As I said, I, I'm representing, I've, I, I want to not have the rules that I have set up for my painting. Sometimes I want to just, like, smash them and be like, no, I don't have to care about light sources. Um, <laughs> right, but you know I'm not there yet. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, I can imagine like one of the models being at a Frankenthaler show, and then you get to go to town on all this abstract work mm-hmm. behind them. <laughs> I mean, oh my God, I just cross our fingers and our toes so that it happens. It, it's really cool how they're part of that process of you know curating their own you know, images, their pose and stuff. So a lot of the or not a lot, but I mean, a certain element of the content is the fact that they are choosing how they're being seen in a way. Yeah, and they're, I mean, I, I was, as I've said, I went to Musée d'Orsay and Louvre, which is nothing but men and male painters and nothing but women being painted. And, you know, I think back to how many times I casually saw Gauguin's work, you know, and it took some time to understand what's going on there. Or Matisse and his Odalisques, which are my favorite paintings, but even that, you know, it's nothing but women existing in that painting just to be looked at by him. And so I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that and not seeing myself as a woman who would be painted that way, you know, and always been fat, always been a chubby girl always felt like I wasn't worthy of that or it wasn't meant for me. So I, I, you know, so perhaps I'm like, um, you know, creating that space for people like me who, or rather, this is probably where the psychology part of it comes in. I don't want anyone else to feel that way ever again. You know, when you felt something bad, you, you, you know, you don't want others to feel it. So I don't want anyone else to look at art and feel like, well, that's certainly not where my body exists. Right. Well, in the lineage, though, of art history, um, there was a time in that era to where you know voluptuous women certainly was seen as a sign of beauty and actually excess and Mm -hmm. being rich and not having to work yourself to the bone you know what i mean yeah oh definitely like skinniness was not figured attractive at all really well well, that's why you know beauty standards have you know are just societal it's just you know that's it's just contextualized within our society it has nothing really to do with the people but the stories behind them and the time we're in you know, like we used to, just a ten years or so ago, we wanted anorexia was like the most loved form of like women's body, and now we're really into like thick women and like being in shape and like big butts and like you know everything that goes with muscles and who knows what's next. Most likely, fitness will always stay a certain amount of like you know of attention. But so I like that my work. Funny thing about that is it's those are in a way though. It, it really affects the psychology, especially of like women's, mm-hmm. you know, your 
self-worth or you're attractive, but they're trends and they're, exactly. it's like an overarching, you know, because like those magazines aren't, or that, that image isn't the consensus of what, you know, men find attractive necessarily. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it it there are, you know, people who find every body shape, you know, attractive. It's just this sort of overarching, you know, fashion kind of like image thing that's like shoved down everyone's throats through social mm-hmm. media and through, you know, the media in general. Absolutely. But it's it's an idealized sort of view and that's not the view of of I would venture to say most humans because everyone's got their own tastes of what they find attractive, you know? I mean, I, it's all, you're taught in many ways what you find attractive or not. And of course, there's, um, you know, we have preferences or some little ones, but overall, it's really lessons that we are taught, things we're taught that make us, you know, I think a lot about my, my, my wonderful boyfriend, Stuart, who was an artist. I also met him at RISD. Um, he was in the same year as me and Danny. And I like to joke that I'm like, I weigh as much as all of his girlfriends, his ex-girlfriends put together, which isn't true. But sometimes when I look at them, I'm like, it could be. They're very petite ladies. And it took a long time for Stuart to like relearn like what it means to be a man with a woman. Like, you know, what kind of what matters and like. And he always talks about, like, for so long I saw women in some... I didn't see women, but I experienced women as, like, the a picture you show to your friends when you hang out. Like, they're like, show, a, show her to us, you know, like, and they, they rate her or whatever. Not rate her, but they, they compare. I don't, know, I don't know what guys do when they... <laughs> but, you know, in that kind of, like, room where everyone's like, show me the girl you're with right now. And, you know, there's no... No man is taught to do that with a picture of a fat girlfriend because, you know, that's... There's a lot of lessons being taught to both women and men of what it means to have a picture of a fat girlfriend. I remember, I mean, Hannibal Burris, who I like so much as a comedian, he has a bit where talking about how like the worst thing that could happen is dying and then someone finding a picture of a fat girl on your phone. Like that's the kind of lessons that are being taught to men, you know? And so right. that's something that, as I said, you have to learn. You learn and then unlearn. So I, I witness Stuart wanting to unlearn it and then unlearning it. And boy, he's absurdly unlearned it. Stuart is very proud of me in every way as much as I am of him it just took some time for both of us to like he's a skinny blonde boy I had to like be okay with having a smaller man than me which is not something you also see very much there's a lot of things to learn and unlearn and a lot of them are just beauty standards that have nothing to do with who we are but rather media and movies and ads and you know art also yeah yeah. And that's a, that's a specific example of an aesthetic kind of like surface thing. Like I'll give you an example. Like my wife had to learn to love me based on all my idiosyncrasies of my personality of being mm-hmm. a weirdo and like being obsessed about art and not being super organized and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, so, of course. Like she had to. Those everyone has got to like, you know, you make your. <laughs> no, but. You speak- kind of acclimate. Of course, because she probably had a very specific idea of who she wanted to be with, not because she, that's what she thought she wanted, but because that's what she saw. She saw images of women with Prince Charmings or big, broad-shouldered men that have no emotions and are there to rescue you or silly Disney, like silly things that seem like nothing, but those are like you learn how to be with people through those things when there's nothing else to look right. at and then you actually meet people and you're like oh my god we're all so damn complex <laughs> there's no such yeah. thing anyway so yeah absolutely as much as for you it was learning to love the weird things about you for me it's like the belly rolls i have other weird Stu had a lot to adapt i have no <laughs> i can be a lot to handle for anyone i have a lot of opinions and i talk a lot um but my belly roll was something he, he we both had to learn to be comfortable with and so I love to honest. paint them. <laughs> Probably yeah. like eighty percent of humans are a lot to be. With. Oh, all of them. I doubt <laughs> in one oh. in one shape, way, or form, in another. Oh, we're of probably, course. We're we're all kind of a handful. Oh, we're such a and handful. Even if we're kind of not that big of a handful, after twenty years, you're a handful. Mm-hmm. Oh, of course. <laughs> or there will be moments we're all tested. You know, of course, there are couples or people who never get mad. But you're good to say you can't not say something annoying. Sorry. Right, right. She, Trying to get in on the pod. I know, I got a dog. I think she's used to sitting next to me and I'm on the floor right now. So she's like, how do oh. I position my body to be near her? But I can't. 
She's <laughs> this is very hard for her. Pit bulls, they're Velcro dogs. They like to be on oh, their yeah, human. They gotta be they gotta be attached, right? Oh, at all times. So this is like testing everything that's ever been possibly tested. She's so right. Cute, Our though. cats are like that sometimes when they want it. But then mm-hmm. other times it's like, get away from me. You know, they've got <laughs> they it's a little more of like a fair use thing. It's like, I'll sit on you when I want to and otherwise leave me alone. Mm-hmm. My cat's like <laughs> that, cats. except he never wants to sit on me. I won't give up. It's been seven years and I've got many more years of attempts, but it will happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk. That's a good segue to studio life. So mm-hmm. do you, is your studio far from where you live? Is it where you live? How are you working? It's on the first floor of my home. I you earlier, I, that's I said the like, commute. That's the commute. I know. I I think earlier in the podcast, it's something about like walking to my studio, and that's actually like going down two flights of stairs. <laughs> it's not the short commute. It's a very short commute. I want a massive warehouse studio, um, but I bought this home when my boyfriend and I bought this home. We're first time owners last year or a year and a half ago, and it's really big. And so that first floor was just a quite perfect. I mean, I'm a very ambitious person. I like uh, to outdo the last thing I did. It's kind of it yeah. what's, it's what keeps me going. It keeps me kind of excited to to see how I can learn from what I just did and maybe take it one step, not li- maybe not even literally bigger, but bigger in some ways. So um, a year and a half ago, the studio felt huge. Now that I've been in it for a year and a half, I'm like, it's the size of my pocket. Um, <laughs> but it's been, you know, in the I am about to have a solo show at Art All My in uh, upstate New York and it's a mm-hmm. sculpture park and there's an inside space and I'm about, it's, I have an installation and I am it's opening in 28 days or 25 days we're very close which I'm trying to ignore because I have a good amount of work left to do for it but I also I still have a solo show up of paintings at Chart which is right. in Tribeca so in the past year at my first floor home I've had two grand that's that's a lot of work, you know, to fill a Tribeca gallery with big paintings. And I made like nine paintings and seven watercolors, so 16 paintings altogether. And then the installation has like 150 to 200 sculptures. Some are very small, but it's just still a lot. So my huge studio when I moved in a year and a half ago does feel... It feels like it wants to blossom into a warehouse. <laughs> I just right. walk around Philadelphia with my dog when we walk her, being like, I want that warehouse. No, oh, I the want... dream spaces? Yeah. Oh, every, <laughs> everything is a beautiful studio. It's all I look at. I just see everything as a potential studio. That's it. I've been seeing these images of people upstate or out oh. in the Midwest with these huge studios oh. with like beautiful <laughs> light and like nothing around it. And I just, I mean, I get so... I mean, it, it breaks <laughs> my heart. Because I, yeah, I, I like really. it. It looks so beautiful. That's what I want. I want to have to like. I want to echo. <laughs> Shana, right. Shana, yeah, yeah. Shana. That's what I want. You know. That's <laughs> like, and I will get it. You have, you have to walk like fifty yards to yeah. get your the palette back oh, to the painting. I have that would be no issue for me. But you know, one thing I know is if you just it will happen. Am I the thing I like to say to myself, especially like right now, and I'm so stressed and I have so much work to do is one day I'll wake up the day after I finished whatever I was working on or the day I'll, I'll wake up one day it's the day I get what I wanted. And you just have to like, you know, trudge along and continue living and working hard till that day. So one day I'm going to wake up and walk to my huge warehouse studio where I'll have a sculptor sec- section and like a painting section and like a little couch area, obviously. One cannot have a studio without a couch area. Um, and it's just going to be essential. real. It's essential. So I have no, I know, I just kind of live with that. Perhaps I'm, I've been lucky to have a lot of privilege to think that way, you know, that things happen because I am very privileged. But um, you know, I just don't. So, yes, the warehouse studio, it is in my future. I just don't know when. It's a question. Well, mark. here's a here's a question to that, because, I mean, you live in Philly. So, you know, you're you're in the city. But Philly is definitely more, a little more affordable than, than you know, Ooh, L.A. Or, or New York or London or whatever. So, but we all, I think, probably could or or that dream's a little closer if we moved out to, outside the city into where there's a lot of land. I mean, just thinking about Pennsylvania, I'm looking at the Poconos a lot lately, just oh sort of God, eyeing yeah. it. Because I teach at Penn State and it's on the way. And, you know, you can get a lot of land for very cheap. So it could be possible to do it. I mean, do you ever entertain that idea of just moving out? 
do I ever entertain an idea? <laughs> I know we just met, but I thought you knew me better than that. Of course. It's all I think about. Oh, my God. I want, I am, I love animals. I'm, my whole family's vegan, vegan activist brother. I just love an animal person. I don't particularly need humans. It's not, yeah. some people need it. I just like have not, like quarantine has not been that hard for me. Um, so a massive amount of land surrounded by a lot of animals in a huge studio. Oh my goodness. I, I, I mean, I, Angela Dufresne was my professor at RISD. And when we graduated, she invited all the like the second years to go to her upstate New York home. And I mean, oh, my God, it's as if she like, right. like smacked my face and my dream popped out. And like she like because <laughs> it was like, oh, oh there it is. There it is. There's and she just like, on the floor. <laughs> yeah, that's what it, it was like. Unbelievable. And um, it's exactly what I want. So, yes. Oh, my Poconos it would be great. I mean, that would be such a dream. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, that's my we all have to have some sort of like goal or dream, you know. Oh, to, absolutely. To like, you know, something to look for or work towards and, you know, and it can be as simple as like a big space in the country would be. Nice. Oh, it's so feasible. I, uh, over September, I, the only thing I did during quarantine was I went to Wingate Studios, which is in um, Massachusetts. I don't know, somewhere. Yeah, Wingate Studios, it's really incredible. I don't think I'm right. It's right on the border. It's like literally almost on the exact border. Um, but it's incredible when they're like a, they do prints, you know, they've worked with Louise Bourgeois and sold it like the biggest names in you know, recent times. And then, and then me who <laughs> just came along, like crying over the fact that I wasn't with my pit bull for two weeks. Um, and they leave the, oh my God, do they leave the life? Like they're surrounded by artists who are around the same age as them, like in their sixties and seventies, they all have their land. They all meet up on, on Sundays or Fridays to like drink a beer around a fire and then they spend the rest of the week doing their life. Most of them are professors and all of them have practices and they just drive 20 minutes to see each other. And I'm like, wow, I mean, it's, it's been, it's doable. It's not doable. It's being done. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah I think so. The solution is you want that house in the middle of nowhere, but you want to be a 20 minute drive to your close friends. So that's, right. that's a balance. You want to have friends who are 20 minutes away or, you know, down the Best street. to both worlds. Not too close. Let's not get over. Let's not get carried you away. Don't we wanna, don't need to pop in. Exactly. You don't want to bump <laughs> into them accidentally. You want to have to purposely find them, but you want to be able to find them without too much of a drive. <laughs> right. It's got to be that buffer there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's but the it, it just seems so. Not, I mean, after living, you know, in the city, I mean, the pandemic is really obviously like people just left. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people just were like, "Wait, of course. why am I going to pay?" this much money and there's no music there's no restaurants there's no you know what I mean there's no culture really it's all been shut down so, so many people left but I think you know things are getting back they're going to get back eventually knock on wood and um, you know it this the cities will sort of regain their verve but at the same time so many people I think have realized and a lot of this stuff we can just kind of do remotely you know oh absolutely well, I mean, I feel like my whole life and my practice has been ready for a quarantine or a pandemic. I say that sadly, I, but I think the world, I mean, how many of my friends who have nine to five jobs have been living the life working from home and feel no reason to go even back to the office? I mean, right. We're, we're all kind of ready for something a bit different and the world is going to just have to adapt. You can't like, it's like trauma. We have, we can't move on and not acknowledge the trauma we've been through and how we all totally. just like want to live a bit differently now. And not ignore just how sort of unsustainable and non green yeah. that f- past way of working was of just flying everywhere and the office spaces use only a few hours a day. You know what I mean? And like commuting for no reason. It just seems ridiculous to like go back to square one. Oh, you know? I don't think it can really. I think there I has to be some built in flexibility to things. You know, like I remember, you know, pre pandemic, if you would have said, oh, I'm going to zoom into final critiques or something like that, people would be like, what the hell are you talking? There's no way. What are we going to do? Bring a laptop into the room? <laughs> it would have been seemed so yeah. bizarre. But now it's like, yep, oh, that makes sense. You know, so know. many rooms are probably going to be retrofit with projectors and screens and people can beam around. And to be honest, like when I would do a seminar class, I would always, you know, um, yeah. Skype in or like Zoom in a visiting artists and it worked great. So, you know, 
why can't we do that? But I mean, I think as most of the world, once you have to do something, you're like, okay, it works, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you know, yeah. So like now there's like no way of like denying it because we all roll out. We all know. (laughs) Yeah. You can't, you can't pretend like we can't do this thing. We did it like literally overnight. It was like, okay, online, you know, a couple weeks ago I had like four studio visits in one week all over zoom. I mean, it was. I rarely have had so many studio visits in my life in one short period of time, but all over Zoom. And yeah. they were all charming. I mean, I, I had a studio visit with people in China. <laughs> I mean, people who would, would never actually come to my studio. I had engaging, lovely conversations. I mean, nothing was lost. If anything, in some ways, a lot was gained. I was able to like reach out significantly further than like the, my studio and people actually coming inside. I don't know. I loved it. No, no regrets. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's funny, I never, I, you know, I talk about this a couple, a few times. I don't really have that many studio visits, generally, like pre-pandemic. You know, I'm just Me not too. a big, like having people over all the time. And um, I had, this is a secret just between me and you. I, I had a studio that. visit last week. Hmm. Like in person? In, in person, yeah. That's very exciting. I mean, I mean, everyone, including myself, was double vaxxed and clear and masked and all that That's the privilege of being in America stuff, right now. It was weird. Yeah, of course. There were like a few in people space. in my studio. Yeah. It I want to I want to quickly say I just said no regrets and not no regrets. I always forget that uh, you're not you're not I, there I once saw a tattoo of someone saying no regrets. They meant to say no regrets. <laughs> and you know it's one of those things where I said it a couple times as a joke and like 15 years later I still still say no regrets. It was just in case someone was listening and said, "Did she just say no regrets?" I want to clear the air. Don't they know this is this is the slang. It's a slang, no sorry. Regrets. Um, but yeah, I have not had a studio. Oh, I actually, what am I talking about? I had a studio visit in person yesterday. <laughs> That's how tired oh, wow. I am. I like forgot. But yeah, I had people in my studio and I can tell how different the time is. Even though everyone was vaccinated, we were still kind of working in a way that no one was ever really close to one right. another. Yeah. It was almost like we had like a magnet, like anti-magnet, or if I moved a little bit, everyone else moved. So we beautifully like floated around my studio without ever really being each other's space, which is not a dance I've ever had to do pre-pandemic. But now I feel like we're all like professional, <laughs> knowing how to not touch and not be in each other's breathing space. Yeah, I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm kind of that person regardless. Like I don't really want to be up in people's mm, faces. Mm, certainly. And like anytime I would go to a music venue, like a show or like a sports event or something where there's a lot of people around, I never was super comfortable being really close to a lot of people (laughs) i remember early in the pandemic there were people when they first started trying to do these outdoor shows like music shows Mm -hmm. and there were like these like metal pods that they made that were tables where like four people could sit like families or whatever Mm -hmm. and they were all spread out and i thought that's really nice (laughs) no that's lovely (laughs) you don't there's no touchy like you don't have to be you know breath to breath to some guy like you know whatever it is i mean absolutely that's um that's me yeah. I also so it's yeah. I have a jokey. I'm the Jew. I'm Jewish and Russian. We're a sweaty group. My family. I have no need to touch people. I'm like, do I need your body heat near me? <laughs> Not right. especially. I hold enough body heat for all of us. So space and breath. I mean, it's just. And I don't like. There's nothing more that I like in this world. So yes, yeah, metal pods. I agree. Oh, I remember those days of working in Midtown and being in the train in rush hour mm. where it's just, you're just crammed up. <laughs> Ooh, gives me yeah, the chills, chills these yeah. days to think of that. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> the worst. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the last sort of thing I didn't touch on at all was music. I mean, are you a fan? Is it, mm. is it a part of your life or are you kind of passive? Well, it's something that comes up a lot in my household. My boyfriend, Stuart, loves music. So much so he spends a lot of time talking about how he thinks... To him, at least, it's a much better vehicle for art than art than fine arts, like I do. I'm a bit of a silly goose when it comes. <laughs> I'm going to use silly goose with pride <laughs> because, honestly, it's right. It's correct. I like music like a warm blanket. I like it to be an old friend that I've heard many, many times, and that I um, I'm not someone who particularly needs new music. So I feel like I. It's hard for me to bring a new song into my life because they're like my friends. I'm like, but are you the same? Are, will you fit with my gang, with my clique? I don't know yet. So, so music plays a bizarre role in my life. It's it's like a, I grew up, my father's 80. 
I grew up, my father's 50 years older than me. I literally thought all movies were Broadway movie, movies until I was 10. Because <laughs> all, I lived in France, so all I had in terms of English were things my father brought into the house. I literally thought all movies were Broadway. So I thought the Beatles were one of the only bands ever. So for like 10, 15 years, I'm like, of course I know the Beatles. They're the only band that has ever existed. <laughs> so I feel like I have this like kind of old fashioned um, relationship to music. That's, yeah. Do you like old timey, old timey? I really like old timey. I like things slow. I I I self diagnose myself as an empath. I take in a lot of what's being thrown at me. I cry when I see people cry, and I will laugh when people laugh, and I mean that quite literally. So music has to stay very slow and calm for me. Anything else, I can feel like my blood boiling with it. Versus my boyfriend. Yeah. I mean, he listens to like. Th- I sometimes call his music like if uh, like garbage disposal <laughs> marries uh, you know cans being smacked together with like a <laughs> a sheep screaming I don't know and he loves it and like to me it's like uh, if he ever he tries to put his headphones on my ears and I feel like I'm about to have a heart attack every time I'm like what's happening and he loves it he spends all day um, but I also love that I, I find that unbelievable that he can listen to that and find pleasure. He loves like music. My boyfriend loves songs that are like an hour long and no no tune repeats. And I like yeah. like the Beatles. Were the <laughs> I have said them before, but I really do love the Beatles. And it sucks that I stopped there in some ways, but they were yeah, like my I'm, best friends. I'm imagining you enjoying like an old Billy Holiday record. Oh, like of course. Ballads. Oh, absolutely. That's exactly up my alley. I feel like I that's stopped in, in like yeah. That's. The 60s and the 70s and like some of the time, some, sometimes the 50s and I can tip into the 80s. <laughs> but that's kind of ended around there. Um, you know. Yeah, it's, it's that's so interesting. I love the idea that that you have kind of like a, th- like a, a, a time, you know what I mean, in I a know. way. It makes sense too because it seems like, I mean, just thinking about art, obviously you're looking in like contemporary work too, but I like this idea that when you were growing up, you were just kind of like, it was the Louvre and Musée d'Orsay, there was a kind of a time that was very yeah. formative, I do which becomes a like a blanket, it becomes like a comfort thing, you know? I, I think I look back a lot of my high school friends that I'm still friends with, they're all like romantic, they all seem like they were born and raised in the 60s and they never left. Like they have these like, almost annoyingly overly romantic relationship to like mu- they're all musicians and painters a lot of them and writers the most academic is one who has who wrote a thesis on conspiracy theory so you know also not we're all bizarre free spirited people um and they all you know they're overly romantic and i feel like we all found each other because we wanted to stay stuck in that time uh, but I, uh, I wish I had a better relationship with music. My dirty secret is how I work really hard. I work really long hours, and I work all the time. I have not taken a weekend off. I don't. I just don't take weekends off, so I can't even tell yeah. you when's the last time I did it. I like watching TV shows when I paint. I watch. Oh, mur- yeah. I watch murder shows. I'm just gonna be honest. Here's my. Here's the Shona secret that anyone who knows me knows because it's real. And I don't really watch them. I don't pay attention. I like this like white noise in the background. I like that I... Why do I like crime shows? After everything I've told you about having to stay calm and all that, I just love bad guys. I love uh, like Monk right now. I'm like eight season in to Monk. I just, oh, yeah. I just love a quirky guy, a quirky person catching criminals. And it's what keeps me working for 12 hours straight is the casual background noise of um, uh, clues being discovered. It's, do you uh, ever do the uh, the podcast of like cereal and oh, things like that? All so of them. good, right? Oh, all of them. Speaking of Pennsylvania, she's based in <laughs> State College. Yeah, the the woman who does that. Yeah. Oh no, those are really that's, good. That's exactly up my alley. Like real, like real crime. All of that. I don't. I don't know why. I'm. I, it's, I'm a crier, so I cry for the people who are being hurt. I mean, I, it's like a hot mess. Why do I do this to myself? But it keeps me. <laughs> it keeps me going. I, I can't explain it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, my my wife is really into those kind of like psychological drama, mm-hmm. thriller sort of things. And 
and specifically like the Korean ones. And it's mm-hmm. like, there's always like when I'm in the living room, it just sounds so tense. And I wonder it like, so why tense. do you put yourself there? Cause she's got a stressful job and stressful everything. And then she, she unwinds by watching other people yell at each other and back <gasps> like the penthouse one that just came out. She <gasps> loves it. Oh, yeah. It's like super into that <gasps> stuff. And Maybe because it's not it. our drama. Maybe it's the fact that it's not ours. It's someone else's. You get yeah. to relax and like judge and uh, have thoughts and just like, drop it's not yours to really carry i don't know i do feel yes. it i mean i uh <laughs> love the, i'm glad it's not me yeah glad that's feeling, not me yeah uh, <laughs> i'm happy i didn't get cut up into little bits and pieces that's kind of the kind of thing i say um i love tiktok so tiktok has become something kind of minorly important during quarantine it was just kind of my friend i feel like i everything when by Bi- when biden won i experienced it through tiktok through like people yeah. like running in the streets that's how all my feelings I don't know. I just felt very connected to it. And one of my favorite things about TikTok is they use sounds and everyone like uses the same sound over and over again. Right. So you have this, and one of them is a, a really creepy voice that's describing a murder. It's like, and her ears were plucked and her eyes were plucked and her toenails were pulled off. It's like, a, it's describing a terrible murder. And then all the videos that go with it are like girls, like pretty girls putting their nail polish on or like hanging out with your best friend and drinking wine as they both watch TV. And it's, the audio is a mo- like a documentary about someone's fingernails being pulled out and I just bond with it so much I think we all like to like a girl's night in is putting a mask on and watching like a docu-series about that girl that was kidnapped 10 years ago and her body was found 5 years something creepy like that I feel like we all love to do it Danny Farrell my best friend in the whole world he and I he loves it much more than I he's a sicko <laughs> He's not a sicko. <laughs> he's not. He's like a near flawless. He's a great person. Um, but he and I do share a, a similar love for like really. He knows them all. Any murder that's happened in the past like 20 years, he like will tell you every detail there is. I don't have that kind of knowledge. So um, I don't know. It brings people together. <laughs> Other people. I was going to say, nothing brings two people together by a shared penchant for the mm, macabre. I mean, honestly, and that's so f- Danny and I are both squish balls. We both don't like hurting people. We both are emotional, like we're squishy people on, on the inside with big hearts. And yet we both, if we could, just spend a whole day watching um, murders being solved. I don't know, maybe I was meant to be a detective or maybe I was a detective in a past life. You just don't oh, know. There you go. You know, there's so I many options. <laughs> French murder mystery. Exactly. Je ne, yeah, exactly. Je ne sais quoi. Maybe, I don't know. This is just, I can't explain it. Hmm. hmm. Finger I on took, my chin. Took French for seven years and never used it. And then by the time I got to France, they, were, they weren't having it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, French is a really hard language. I, uh, I feel my biggest fear right now is if someone asked me to like write something out in French. Whew. I can speak it, but writing it. You know, it's been 12 years that I haven't had to, like, write a paragraph in French. It's a hard language. I don't envy I don't my... I'm, I'm in a Japanese family. French seems so easy to me. Oh, Because I'm, of I'm the to relationship say, yeah. to, like, Roman... You know what I mean? Like, there's... Oh. In the alphabet and stuff. So, there's at least you know, some learning line. Japanese is, like... And now I really want to learn Mandarin. Like, I would mm-hmm. love to learn it. I just can't... The time, I can't do it. But it seems even harder because the tones you know All the I'm tones. uh I'm trying to get my boyfriend Stuart to learn French because if we ever do get married one day it wouldn't be that hard for him to get a French citizenship he doesn't need to speak a certain amount of French and take a test or something um and I just want him to Rosetta Stone but I feel like I'm making it sound like it's so easy I don't really know what entails Rosetta Stone but I'm like just Rosetta Stone it it's you know, learn the, French. the solution to it. Yeah, All I you have feel to do like is turn that on and you. Yeah, learn it. <laughs> you'll be fine. Just like buy it sixty nine dollars. It's no biggie. Um, so I don't know if that's true, but I do hope he learns French, and I hope one day you find the time to learn Mandarin. If you want yeah, to do it, so. one day you'll wake up. <laughs> the day after you learn Mandarin. There you go. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just, just the wait. day after they make it implantable. Exactly. You the, it, you'll which wake is up. probably coming. It's gonna Maybe happen. you should uh, get him hooked on like French murder mysteries. and Because reading the subtitles, that can really help you learn. That's true. And he's brilliant. He would learn it so fast. Oh, it almost makes me more angry as I know how good he'd be. Um, but you're right. French murder mysteries done sold yeah. i shall do that i enjoy that i don't know i don't idea. know what they are but they're out there i, I know me neither and they're, and they're probably really good or you could just really 
it, it seems like it could resonate with his personality and his sensibilities. You could just have him watch Godard movies over and over, like that's, Weekend, Ad Nauseum. Oh, you know, the avant-garde with a little, you know... Oh, my God, Paul yes. Say, like, thrown in might be the solution. <laughs> he would love that. I always, we spend, like, hours every night picking a movie because I like to walk away lively and happy because life is good, and the movie reminded me that there's happiness, and he likes to walk away questioning, why life? Why do I live? And we have, it's hard to find happy movies that make you snort your laughing so hard, but also question the purpose of existence. Um, but I feel like the French could be people who would do that really well. Oh, have you, has he seen Godard's Weekend? Oh, yes. Have you seen that movie? Yes. I mean, oh, that's, yeah, yeah. that's, has got the, the, it's all got it of all. the elements in it. Humor, like the questioning life, the whole bit. It's, I mean, it's kind of meant there. for that. I know. Maybe this is what it's meant to be. All those movies are great. This I may- really love Jacques Tati. He's mm-hmm. my, my favorite filmmaker. Playtime, I think, is my all-time favorite movie. But that's less, it's more visual and less about, you know, the language, really. They're almost like moving paintings. I feel like this is the closest I'll ever get to convince him because this is the best argument I've ever had for him learning French. So everything you're saying, I'm taking notes right now. Because, yes, I should do this. This is how I'm going to make him learn French. Thank you, well, Brian. Sure. My high school teacher bribed us because she was charismatic and she always brought Nutella and French bread to class. Mm, so, so that clever. was the way we got hooked. It yeah. was écouté et répété over and over <laughs> and over with Nutella. And for the longest time, I thought Nutella was French. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, so much. it might just as well be French with how much the French love it, though. So it's not wrong right. to make that assumption. We'll give yeah, it to you. Well, we French people will give it to you. The bread was the real. The baguette, French. absolutely. Hmm. The baguette. Um, <sighs> so, so with what you have going on, I mean, you have the show up now. How long is it up? A charter? It's been up for two months. It's a chart in Tribeca, and it's it actually charter. closes this Saturday. So, but it's been up since for two months now. It's had its, it's lived its life. It's time. But then our Oh My opens the 29th. Right. Um and that's up for I think most of the summer. And uh, our Oh My, even if you don't go for my work, you should just go to our Oh My, for the dog walk in the sculpture park. And also, I've never you can been. go. Oh, it's ginormous. So when I first met, went to, to find out about it, when he they offered me the show, uh, they took me, it was raining, and they took me on this little golf cart, and we, my first golf cart, and we zoomed through this enormous park with ginormous sculptures as Zach Foyer, who was in charge, just like pointing at them and telling me this unbelievable history of the artists. It's just like a blast. The, it's pretty incredible. It just exists within I our life. I didn't realize Zach was, Zach, it's Zach's thing. Yeah, it's Zach's thing. Yeah. And he's like the nicest guy. I'd never met him before. And so he's quite a character. So him like furiously talking as he's driving a golf cart, a golf cart as I'm like holding on tight um, for my dear life. As a plus size lady, my, I'm convinced I'm going to break a chair one day. I'm going to top over a car. I don't know. Something like that. A comedic and someone's going to be filming it. It's going to go viral. I know it. TikTok. Uh, TikTok. Oh, this is going to be my, my 15 minutes of fame. Um, but that golf cart moment was one of them. I was like, I'm going to topple it, but it was a blast. Yeah. So go That's great to see my yeah, work no, or not. To, but. Definitely check that out and you check your social media and website and all that good stuff. Thank you. I do have a lot of it. It was great to talk. It was great to meet you. I'm so happy that this has happened. Vision is recorded, produced, and engineered by myself, Brian Alfred. You can find out more about the podcast by going to the website, soundofvisionpodcast.com. Many thanks to the sponsors for this podcast. Golden Artist Colors, they make the best paint. Fulcrum Coffee Roasters, they make incredible coffee. And the New York Studio School, check out their summer marathon programs. Many thanks to Lalatone for the intro and outro music. Michael Lovett for the introduction. Many thanks to Emily Burns for her graphic design for the podcast. Many thanks to you for listening. If you can, leave a rating and review on iTunes. It helps spread the word about the podcast. And check out images at the Instagram page at Sound and Vision Podcast. More good combos coming on the way, so stay tuned. Thanks. <laughs>